Okay. So here are the rails. <laughs> and here is our show. Completely off. Completely gone today. What in the world? Derailed. <laughs> Yay, you're here. Welcome to the CK and GK podcast. Let's get going. All right, it's midnight. You've waited this long for it to come out. Now you're ready to listen to us. Welcome to episode 15. Or you're me and you're just sleeping like a normal human being. (laughs) Weirdo. You've already done the wordle and now you're ready to listen to CK and GK. Welcome. Oh, hi everyone. We're glad you're here. (laughs) This is a great day. As always, I have Caitlin with me, the woman who is cooler than me in every single way, including how she spent her maternity leave, because we learned recently that she watched all of Gilmore. (laughs) What did I watch all of? Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. (laughs) I did remember watching that show when I was much younger. In fact, I had like a babysitter who used to call me Doc because Doc Quinn has red hair. And so that's where it came from. But yeah, I'm definitely cooler than you if I watched Gilmore Girls on my maternity leave and you (laughs) Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. The entire series. Well, she confuses ketchup and hot sauce packets, Pam Beasley, right here in front of us. <laughs> I like that one. That's my personal description. All right. So we also have a guest on our show today. And- our favorite guest. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> you know her, you love her. Ariel is here. She's going to help us Hi. out with our real talk for the day. But I'm not here to talk about Marvel. No, not this time. I know. I'm the jack of all trades. Pretty much. Yeah. This time she's here to talk about something completely different. But before we get to all that stuff, I need to do some shout outs. You guys know I'm trying to listen to as many other indie podcasts as I can. And I learned of one called the Nerd in Texas podcast. And it's a fellow Austinite and fellow teacher. She really was like super stoked to find out that we were in Austin after she listened to our show. And she's next on my list of people to listen to. She caught my attention because one of her students is in like a podcast club at school, which I was like, what? That's the coolest thing I've ever heard. They could probably give us some tips. Right. (laughs) But then she said that one of her students went home and talked to her mom about like how her teacher has a podcast and then she got like recognized from it. So she was super stoked about it. It was like the cutest little story. She was like, it made my day. And I was like, of course it did. One of your students' parents like goes, oh, I've listened to that podcast or something like that. It was really awesome. So she's next on my list of people to listen to, but I just couldn't get enough of that story. And then the other one that I listened to, and this one is not an indie podcast. So my apologies to the indie podcast community, but this one is from Texas Monthly and it's by the legendary Skip Hollinsworth for Texas Monthly and it's Tom Brown's Body. And if you like true crime, This one is really, really good. Really awesome. Is there a twist? I love a good twist. There kind of is a twist. This one is a crazy story. Someone's lying and we just don't know who it is. And like even now, like I don't think they know Mm. what's going on, but it's fascinating. And it's a quick listen. I think each episode's like 40, 45 minutes and there might be like six to eight somewhere in there, but it was a really good listen. So Tom Brown's Body by Texas Monthly. I think that they have their own network, but it's easy to find anywhere you listen. Awesome. Well, it's sports time. Yay. I did not have sports last time. No, you didn't. But I do this time Mm -hmm. because we are coming up on March Madness. And how much do you actually care about March Madness? Um, (laughs) Zero. Okay. I'm just making sure. I I care so little about March Madness. My family (laughs) has a bracket tournament and I haven't even been invited to play yeah that sounds right really legit i have never filled out a bracket like i do not care oh you've never done it i've never done it oh that's but i decided for our listeners yeah i should do a little research so i learned a little bit about march madness okay they start with 68 
teams. It's a lot. It's yeah. not 64. I did think it was 64, but it's not. You would think that it would be a power of two, right? Right. Two squared is four times two, eight times two again, 16, 32, 64. Right. But it is actually 68. The lowest seeds play each other in what they call the first four. Mm-hmm. And that decides who actually will be the 64 teams in the tournament. Mm. Mm. This year, Selection Sunday is the 13th of March. And so that's when you'll be able to find out who will be in the tournament and you can start filling out your bracket. And I'm asking my husband this question. So how do people pick their brackets? And he just kind of looks at me like, Jen, <laughs> yeah, you can pick them by team mascot. You can pick yeah. them by team colors. You can pick them by, you know, one school from each letter of the alphabet. Yeah. But most people actually think about basketball when they are making <laughs> their brackets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they look at like the the seed number and they're like, oh, well, right. They're one like, se- oh, one seed. This so we're team gonna... looks good. Right. They have a lot of great players and right. they've had I've, a hard schedule. I've heard my basketball partner pay attention to that name before. Like for me, I always take Duke really far when I fill out a bracket because that's my husband's favorite team. But I don't know anything there else about go. it. And we know Duke is a basketball school. Yes. Like people think about that. Like right. yeah, Duke Kentucky basketball. and other basketball schools. Yes. Right. Um, George Mason, not a basketball school, but they did Indiana. win a tournament one year when I lived in Northern Virginia. So oh. psh, yeah. the world went crazy. Yeah. What I am here to tell you about March Madness is I have lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. A so that will get edited out. Um, this is, yeah, <laughs> true. Even. Like maybe this is case in point. Like I don't care. Um, I asked I think him, you should I asked my in. husband, so has there ever been a perfect bracket? And he goes, no, that's why Warren Buffett like puts up a bajillion dollars every year right. for someone to have a perfect bracket. Exactly. So here are the stats on that. Okay. The best bracket ever was in 2019 and it was 50 games. Okay. Before that, it was like 36. Okay. Wow. That's a big jump. Um, how many games are there in total? A lot. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> a big number. I need more than two hands to count that yeah, high. Yeah, more than 50 because 50 wasn't perfect. Um, if you know something about basketball, your chances of having a perfect bracket are one in 120.2 billion with a B. Wow. Wow. If you flip a coin or pick by team mascot or pick by color. I do that. It is a one in nine quintillion. <laughs> chance that you will get your bracket right wow but it's nine and a bunch of zeros y'all i didn't even know quintillion was a number can i just say that quintillion sounds like a number that my kindergartner would make up like it doesn't even sound like a real thing when we count we count hundreds thousands millions billions trillions quadrillions and then comes nine quintillion the chance that you will get your bracket right so good luck you listeners <laughs> yeah. as you're betting on march madness right shout out to number file a youtube channel that i love <laughs> probably you talked about the me before. biggest nerd <laughs> but they you do a whole numbers. special on like how big a billion is and <laughs> if we're playing math confession time one of my favorite books <laughs> as a child was how much is a million by stephen kellogg <sighs> Where they go through and like measure the height of the kids and like if we had a a million kids, they would touch the moon. If we had a trillion kids, they would reach outside the solar system. Like, oh my God, Uh, you just dropped like (laughs) 50 cool points. What are you doing? (laughs) I love math. I love it. I can tell. I can tell that you love it. I also enjoy math. I did teach math for uh, f- five years. I was going to say a number, but that sounds bad for a math teacher to say. I mean, I said how many games are there? A lot. (laughs) <laughs> that's different that's a topic you don't know anything about this is me saying i taught it for five years but not actually giving the number as a math teacher that's just ridiculous <laughs> guys i haven't taken a math class since junior year of high school i found a way to not take math in college that's how much i hate how math. did you do that I was a communications major. That's amazing. <laughs> She's doing like a little shoulder. I thing. love that you are communications major because I will say the same <laughs> proud statement about languages other than English. I have not had to take one until uh, since I was a sophomore in high school. <laughs> 
what is the matter with you uneducated swine? What are you? <laughs> my mom is an interpreter translator, and I am proud to have not studied any language other than English. <laughs> These are two of the smartest women I know. Like, I'm not even kidding. They're so smart. And this is the kind of stuff they're telling me right now. Senior year of high school was the only year that I got straight A's because I didn't take math and I took three electives. It was like creative writing, <laughs> media arts, oral communications. I was a straight A student. Oh, my word. Well, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. And I'm going to give you guys a little bit of inspiration. I'll talk. The Winter Olympics just ended. Yes. One of the uh, finalists in the women's curling event was the Japanese team. And the Japanese team is coached by a Canadian who has the team write affirmations on their hands. And One of the most precious affirmations was on the hand of Japanese curler Satsuki Fujisawa. The note was captured in several pictures and it was just written kind of on the back of her hand, like towards her thumb. And it said, I'm a good curler. I have confidence. Let's have fun. And I thought that was the most precious, sweet thing. And I was like, what? would happen if we all just wrote I am a good blank I have confidence let's have fun I just thought it was so sweet okay, like so this speaks to me because I know you have a tattoo that says have fun today yes I do have a tattoo that says have fun today it says enjoy today it's I like it because it's my dad's handwriting and he wrote it on a card that he and my mom gave to me the day that I got married so I have my mom's that says, I love you, mom. And then it, my dad says, enjoy today. And it's in their handwriting. So I love it too. It, like it just, but it spoke to me because I was like, you know, these are the kinds of things that I should be saying to my kid before he goes to school every day, right? I should be saying, you know, I'm a good student. I have a kind heart. I have confidence. Let's do something like that. And we do kind of do some affirmations with him. And, and one of his is supposed to be have fun. It made me so happy to see like an Olympic level athlete putting that right. on her hand. It was so sweet. All right. Do you have any gems this week? Okay. So here we go. Are you ready <laughs> oh, to get on this I am train? ready. You may have heard this, but Meatloaf the singer recently died. Didn't that happen right around the same time as like Betty White, Bob Saget? Like it all kind yes. of happened at once, yes. right? It was like the bad things happened in threes and he was the right, third. right. Celebrity death okay. threes. Yeah. I don't know about you ladies, but meatloaf was really important in my childhood. Um, <laughs> okay. So my uh, parents listened so- to like Chris Isaac and Bonnie Raitt. So I'm going to yes, need some no. elaboration here. <laughs> so my mom and dad both have very eclectic music tastes. My dad loves the girl groups of the 60s and always will. Okay. Okay. And my mom, on the other hand, loves turning meatloaf up loud enough that the speakers are shaking. (laughs) And so we would come home from school. I would do anything for love. And it is great. Okay. So meatloaf died. And it was a sad thing for us. Right. Sure. Memories. Right. I gotcha. And I texted my mom and I said, hey, RP Meatloaf. And either my brother or my sister also texted her, but I don't know who. But <laughs> my mom says, oh, I got a text from two of the kids about Meatloaf. And my dad says, well, two out of three ain't bad. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and if you're not laughing, it's because you don't know. I need you. <laughs> I want you. But I there mean. ain't no way I'm ever gonna love you. So don't be sad. Cause two out of three ain't bad. Gosh. Oh man, coming in hot with the dad jokes. I am here for it. Right? I love it. That's a good one, too. I'm sorry for your family's loss, but I appreciate the joke. (laughs) And also the vocal performance you just gave us, because that was pretty incredible. I do try and sing every episode. When I was a classroom teacher, I was constantly singing stuff like, turn in your work over there. You know where to put it. Like stuff like that. (laughs) I was in the worship band at my church. Oh. For years. Okay. For years. Um, and one time the worship pastor oh, no. looks at me and says, Jen, you can play any instrument you want on this stage, 
but we will never put a microphone near you <laughs> because you are a vocal terrorist and we are trying to bring people to God, not away from him. Maybe they'll pray. Maybe they'll just say, dear God, make it stop. Vocal terrorist. A pastor called me a vocal terrorist. And I just high-fived him and I'm like, yeah, man, you're probably right. That's amazing. My family has singers in it. My mom was always singing in the car. I sang for a number of years. My sister is an opera singer. She's married to a man who is also an opera singer. They have joined a company in Germany. I don't do it very much for people. But when I do it, I'm being ridiculous about it. You know, like turn the work into the basket. <laughs> I don't think my son likes it. Ariella, do you have ridiculousness? Do I have ridiculousness? So we got Killian um, for his fifth birthday back in June. We got him a, an indoor swing. Um, he has ADHD and sensory processing disorder. So like things like swinging, really, really great for him. We'll spend like 45 minutes to an hour just swinging outside. So we got him an indoor swing. This has been the few days that we've had it up have been phenomenal. He is just constantly in it. He woke up the other day and went like straight into the swing. He'll like pretend that he's like a caterpillar. He'll do some kind of kind of dangerous things that I probably shouldn't let him do. Yeah, but survival. It's I fine. Do anyway, we have a really short, it's a really narrow hallway. So he'll swing until he can hold onto the banister <laughs> and then kind of like hoist himself up and then like let go and then do this like really <laughs> swing back. How very like Peter so, Parker of him. Like I'm totally picturing like him yes. clinging onto a wall. Like, yeah. Like, oh no, it is very <laughs> Spider-Man. And he's already in martial arts and we've had to take a break this past month because that's at 530. Since he exited the womb, like 430 to 630 has been the most awful. Yeah, we that's call the that witching the hour. hour. So. Oh, you call it the arsenic yeah. hour. I've always heard of it as the witching arsenic hour. hour oh, witching good. hour. Psh, that's yeah. weak. That's weak. <laughs> yes. For her, it's, it's for arsenic. you or it's for them. <laughs> yes. But somebody's getting arsenic. Yeah, it could be it could be the Malibu hour or the Malo hour or. <laughs> it took me it a second to really like recognize. Her. Oh no, she's not talking about going to the beach. <laughs> All right. Well, do you have any obsessions for this week? I have two. Okay. The first one I learned about from one of my students, and I don't know if you remember like Badger 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 dot com or like the Llama Song or oh, oh yeah the we Hamster to... Dance. You remember these so, like really awful oh, websites that yeah. you would go to? Yeah, yeah. I have a story about the llama song. Okay. Remember when like you didn't used to be able to hyperlink, you could just send the link. When we finally learned how to hyperlink, my roommate in college, Maureen, and I were sitting there <laughs> hyperlinking the llama song and sending it back and forth to each other. Like, so we knew what it was, but we would still <laughs> click on it anyway. <laughs> And one day, Here, check this out. Right. One day, we're sitting Breaking in the notes. same room. Right. We have our laptops on our lap, like sitting in the same room and doing this. This is the dumbest thing ever, but we were enjoying college life a lot. One day, my boyfriend, who is now my husband, comes over and we start sending him llama links. I'm pretty sure he almost walked out. <laughs> I, I love this llama links, it's good alliteration. Ariel, you're the comm major. Did I did I do the alliteration right? Absolutely. Perfect. Great. Anyway, okay, I'm so sorry. Proceed. One of my kids told me about this website, pointerpointer.com. Oh, Lord. The whole point of the website is they will find a picture that points to your mouse. <laughs> so so you, you can move the cursor around on the screen and then a picture will come of someone pointing to it. And it's just like the most random pictures. Some of them are posed. Some of them just like some guy in the background pointing to something and then it always comes to your cursor. That's amazing. We must have played it for 15 minutes. Oh, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. <laughs> Me and a 12 year old. Oh, do it. Put it, put it in the corner. Do you think they'll find it in the corner? Yes. They'll find it in the corner. <laughs> this is middle school. One time I spent an entire class period trying to explain to a classroom full of seventh grade girls that a chimichanga and a chinchilla were the same thing. <laughs> oh, no. And then when they graduated from the middle school, I made a sign that said chimichanga does not equal a chinchilla. And I held it up in front of them. And the amount of laughs that I got from that graduation was amazing. But that's what middle school is. It's pointerpointer.com and yeah. chinchilla versus chimichanga. That's all it is. If you can handle those conversations, then you can be a middle school teacher. 
So the other thing I'm obsessed about is Love is Blind season two. That has been all over my Twitter. I don't know anything about it. (laughs) Okay, so it is total trash. Oh, man. It is so good. And it puts the Bachelorette to shame. Okay, 90 Day Fiance, at least you get to see their face. So the whole concept of Love is Blind is 15 guys and 15 girls go on these pod dates where they're like locked in closets across from each other and they talk to each other. You live in the pods for like, I don't know, 10 days, two weeks, whatever. And then you're supposed to get engaged at the end. No. And you cannot see your fiance until you get engaged. What if he's a hobbit? So once someone accepts a proposal, then they get to see each other and they run and they love each other. It's so beautiful. Um, And then after (laughs) all the engagements are made, they then go on a romantic getaway to Mexico. And they <laughs> stay at a, at a resort in Mexico and then they have to move in together and the show ends with them getting married and then deciding at the altar whether they should get married or not, which is not how weddings work. Let me help you. <laughs> Normally, you have already decided if you are getting married or not by the time you make it to the altar. I mean, if you're Sam, you're going to leave her at the right. altar. So <laughs> this show does feel very much like what my child would do. <laughs> I did think of him. Oh, jeez. But it is complete trash. It's so good. And, you know, people are like making confessions like, I don't find him attractive, but I do like who he is inside. (laughs) And one guy was like, I don't want to date someone that I can't lift up on my shoulders at a festival. What? And the other girl's like, "Um, the whole point of this is you're supposed to not look at us. And now she's engaged to him. Oh, my goodness. It's oh, so good. It's so good. And, oh, and it's hosted by Nick Lachey and Mrs. Nick Lachey. What's her name again? Mrs. Nick Lachey. You think I knew? If I knew it, I would have said it. <laughs> Someone is yelling it at us because they know. What was that show where they would like not get to meet the person at all? Like they like got interviewed by like five psychiatrists. Married at first sight. Yeah. I think that there were a couple, but I know there's at least one that's still together and they've like documented their infertility issues and all that. But that woman I remember was like, I I do not want to marry him. He does not look like what I pictured for myself. And they ended up being like perfect for each other. On these shows, you have to be together for something like three years to keep the Neil Lane diamond. Nah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I like shiny things. What can I say? <laughs> I like the, I couldn't tell, like, are diamonds her best friend or is she ready to turn those in? It depends on the diamond. I mean. And let's be clear, my diamond would have a halo. So it would be many diamonds. That's. (laughs) Do you get to specify? Will Neil Lane make you what you want? That was one of the dramas on this season is one of the girls is wearing an engagement ring that she does not like because her fiance did not ask her what she wants. But another guy in the pod did ask and he said, you don't like that ring. Because I know you like gold. <gasps> hmm. Gold's not my thing for... Anyway, this is neither here nor there. <laughs> so much of this has to be trimmed down. I am so sorry. I have just gone on. What are you watching? I am back to watching Dairy Girls again. If you have not seen this show, it's been out for a while. It's not Dairy Like the Cow. It's D-E-R-R-Y. Dairy is a city in Northern Ireland. And if you know anything about Irish history, you know that there was the Troubles and it was war between Catholics and Protestants. It's been going on for hundreds of years in the late 1900s, <laughs> which I hate saying, but the 1980s, 1990s-ish, it kind of blew up. And Oh my and God, then- late 1900s. I thought you meant like 1908. Yep. I said that just for you. No. <laughs> That's early. So so anyway, you know, all that was happening. And then we had Dolores O'Riordan from the Cranberry. So basically, this show is about these Irish Catholic teenagers who are living in the city of Derry, which is a hotspot for the Irish Troubles. It is mm. a Protestant part of Ireland. It's the northern part. The Catholics call it Derry and the Protestants call it London Derry. Anyway, this is these kids having the most ridiculous and hilarious situations happen to them. The first episode is them in detention and what they're there for. And they're there with their, you know, nun teacher. I I don't want to spoil it because it's so funny, but these, these kids are hilarious. And two of the actors are from Derry. So their accents are all authentic and genuine. And there'll be times when, when, 
my husband and I will look at each other and we're like, did you, did you catch that one? So we're like constantly rewinding it. It takes me probably three or four minutes to get acclimated. And there'll be times where my husband's like, you're going to need to tell me what just happened because I'm laughing hysterically. And he's like, I missed the joke because it's hard to understand them. But when you do, it's so, so good. They use the word we all the time. Like, oh yeah, blame the we. And it's just like, it's so, so funny. If you're looking for the wee girl, she's over here. It's just so good. It's so good. It's oh so my good. Gosh. It makes okay, me laugh so, so hard. This week, my kids at school are doing a project where they have to do a news broadcast. And I just overheard one group like planning out. And they said, what if all of our aliens had Australian accents? Yes. And I was like, I don't even care what your project is about. You guys are getting an A. If one of your suggestions is that you include aliens who have Australian accents, we're done. Perfect. Win. You win. You win the the project. It's done. It's perfect. But yeah, it's just, it's such a funny show. It's, it's a little dark, but that's how I prefer. It's, it's not, it's dark. Like Schitt's Creek is dark, right? Like it's not Fleabag. (laughs) It's not that kind of dark, but it's just, it's so much fun to listen to and to watch and to have this show be that hilarious against the backdrop of the troubles is very, very amazing. And anyway, it's my thing that like whenever we put it on, I'm so happy to watch it. It's great. That's my obsession. Anyone else doing anything smarter? Reading, perhaps? I don't know. <laughs> I am obsessed with the Throne of Glass series. Book or TV show? <laughs> yes, book, book. <laughs> book 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 so this series it's a young adult series which I didn't know until like halfway through the first book so there were parts that I was kind of disappointed in but I am so obsessed with it I'm like emotionally invested in these characters now even though the books have some really like problematic Mm. themes that sounds like YA to me. <laughs> yeah. It's like reading Harry Potter as an adult, which which is what I did. I read it the first time as an adult. And like you're reading it with an adult's eyes. So, so you're you're seeing all of the problematic mm-hmm. things in it, but you're really, really invested yeah. in all of the characters. So that's how I'm, I, that's what's happening now. I'm on the fourth of like, I don't know, seven or eight books and I'm obsessed with it and also really angry. That was at how it. I was with the Hunger Games series. Like I couldn't stop reading it, but I was like, this makes me so angry. And then uh, also, I'm not ashamed to say I was obsessed with Twilight too for a while. Like I read that as an adult also because my students were reading it. So I jumped on that train and I was pretty into it and also very horrified by a lot of what I was reading. So I get that. It's like, that's what YA is. But it's also like really easy to read and it keeps your attention. So it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's kind of like what I need right now is stuff that's going to keep my attention. The problem is it's keeping my attention too much and I'm reading yeah. it until like 1130 at night, which is way You're past reading. my time. You're not scrolling. So that's fine. That's true. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, so it's a healthy habit. Speaking of healthy habits. Oh, like what I did there? That was a really good transition. You are all welcome. So the reason that Ariel is here is to give us a little bit of information on how to start a yoga practice for yourself. Um, So take it away. Yeah, absolutely. That's my favorite thing is to introduce people to yoga. So I started doing yoga in 2007. Um, If you don't count the semester that I did it in college when I wasn't taking a math class. (laughs) Um, senior year in college, right? I took ballet one nice. to realize my dream of wanting to be a ballerina. And I took yoga. What PEs did you take, Caitlin? In college? In college. Didn't you have to take PE? No. What kind of crazy schools did you guys go to? Yeah, I, no, I didn't have to take it. I wanted to. I'm like, oh, it's senior year. I'm going to take ballet. Oh, I had to take two to graduate. I took bowling and ice skating. Yes. Can you like do like triple flips and stuff like that on the ice? Tell me you can. Yeah. Come on, Christy Yamaguchi. Tell me you can do it. In a semester at college, <laughs> ice skating, I learned a triple axel. <laughs> Texas A&M, you know, is the foremost of figure skating. <laughs> figure sk- Did you know that Scott Hamilton lives in Denver and practices on a rink in town? Do Fun you facts. know I've been to the mall where Tanya Harding hit Nancy Kerrigan on the knee? <laughs> Yours is cooler. <laughs> Lloyd Center has it all, including a sorted past. 
It was so random. Anyway, go ahead, proceed with the yoga. <laughs> okay. In the past, I've taught at a studio where I got my certification. I taught at a gym and I currently teach um, at a community center. I love bringing people into yoga. So this is fun for me. There's lots of different types of yoga, but the one kind of yoga that is really popular in the United States is Ashtanga yoga, which has the eight limbs of yoga. And asana, which is the postures, is just kind of a part of that. Okay. Within this kind of umbrella, you're going to have a whole bunch of different types. The most gentle is going to be restorative yoga. Okay. So restorative yoga does a lot of um, meditative work. It is very supported in that you will use a lot of props in order to get comfortable. Your body should be physically comfortable. So you are going to be propped up with lots of bolsters and blankets and and eye pillows and and just feeling really, really comfortable Mm. because you have to focus on doing the inner work. Mm. So it's meditative and you're going to be in the postures for like 15 to 20 minutes. We're going to get you in a posture and then you'll be there for a while. I took a restorative class on Sunday nights. Oh, I bet that was nice. Yeah, they would dim the lights as the sun set and then light candles. Just chill out. And it was such a great way to close out the weekend and kick off the week. Yeah, I love teaching restorative yoga. I have um, additional training in teaching restorative yoga. I hate doing restorative yoga Mm. because sitting in like one spot for like 15 minutes for somebody with ADHD is really, really tough. Yeah. My therapist is also a yoga teacher and she's like, you need to go to restorative yoga. But on the flip side of that, you have what you're probably going to see in terms of more athletic yoga is power yoga. Okay. Power yoga is kind of this catch-all term. Technically, my um, certification is in power yoga. I don't teach right. power yoga. And I don't like to do power yoga. This is where you're going to get a lot of like the strength building, a lot of the flexibility. A lot of times it's done in a hot room. How hot it's going to be is going to depend on the studio. That's another reason why I don't really like to do power yoga because I hate yeah. when it's super, super hot. This is definitely for people who really just need something that is going to really, really challenge you. And then there's going to be stuff kind of in between. What yoga is best for you is going to depend on what your goals are, you know, or your goals to just, you know, relax and meditate and, you know, calm yourself, then you're going to want to do something more gentle. So you've got restorative, gentle yoga, yin yoga. And then if you want something that is kind of more athletic, like I like a quick vinyasa class that moves really, really Mm. quickly. Um, That kind of goes from like one breath to one movement, like fluid movements where you're not staying in postures. Like a flow sort of sequence Um, kind of deal? Okay. Yes. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I would say the easiest thing to do would be to just go online and look at something like Yoga Journal or um, Yoga International is going to have different introductions to different kinds of yoga. Okay. And from there, you can kind of see all the descriptions and kind of figure out like what okay. would be best. If you're a beginner, I like telling people to go to the most gentle of classes, not necessarily a, a restorative class, but go to something that's either billed as a beginner class or is something like a gentle yoga class. And then you can kind of get the hang of all the postures you can get the hang of what people are calling Mm. them. And then you can kind of build up from there. I don't want to go to a class because personally for me, um, vocabulary is an issue. Like I feel like, you know, you can use vocabulary to include people or to exclude people. And if you are not part of the yoga community and you don't know the words, it can be a little bit intimidating to go into a class and like be the one looking around and being like, I have no idea what that word means. So can you give us a little bit of information about where to go? So you've got your studios, you've got your gym, and then you've got your community centers, and then obviously at home. Yeah. Pros and cons to everything. So 
studios, you're definitely going to get a really tight community feel. That can go two ways, right? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> that could go two ways, right? Like if you're looking for a community and you feel like you're good at making friends in a community, then that could be really great. The things with a community is that it can become very clicky. Mm. It's sort of like two sides of the same coin and you just have to find a studio. But the good thing about studios is they also tend to have a lot of workshops. So if you want to increase your skills, if you want to dive deeper, into certain things, they will have workshops that you can do. Um, they usually have lots of class options. They'll have power classes. They'll have restorative classes. They'll have yin classes. There are exceptions to these rules. Like if you go to a Bikram studio, they are just going to do Bikram yoga. If you go to a Baptiste studio, you're probably going to get mostly Baptiste. And these are two styles of yoga that I don't really know much about, but are kind of controversial. So I'm not going to get into like the deep dive into it. But for the most part, if you go to any yoga studio, they'll have different options for you. So there's a lot of variety. Well, my relationship with yoga started in 2003. And much my my relationship with yogurt ebbs and flows. <laughs> we just had this conversation. Ariel and I just had this conversation with our friends, yes, Brenna and Joy, did. and I said, we were just talking about yogurt. <laughs> Does anyone else have a weird relationship with yogurt where they go on this kick and they'll buy a bunch of yogurt and you'll eat two and then you're done and it just sits in your fridge for forever? This is what I do. Yeah. I do it with bananas and I do it with yogurt. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. Well, I will get hooked on yogurt and eat it, eat it, eat it. Yep. And then I'm off it. And I have done the same with yoga. There's been times in my yeah. life where I was going three or four times right. a week. And then there's been times where I've gone years without it. Yeah, no, it can definitely be like that. I like studios. I think studios are one of those things where if you find a really good studio, like the studio that I was going to in New York, Essence of Yoga Studio in Holbrook on Long Island, I will <laughs> shout it out because that was, that was your place. That was my place. Shirley and her studio set the bar so mm. high. Yeah, it's very hard to match it. But if you can find a really, really great studio, you can have an awesome experience there. If you want to just kind of like step into yoga and then like step out of it very easily, like gyms and community centers are, are usually pretty good for that. Gyms, because generally speaking, your class is going to be included in your membership. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for something really relaxing, a gym is not going to be it. <laughs> Unless they have like a dedicated yoga space. Gyms are good for kind of dipping your toe into the water if you already have a gym membership and you just kind of want to test out yoga with one of the big downsides that I that I kind of saw with gym yoga from working there is it can be very fitness centered. You'll get a lot of people wanting to really like work out and get like their butt kicked. Like diet there's culture. There's a lot of diet culture. Yeah, there's a lot of diet culture in gym yoga. But for the most part, I think it can be like a good place to just sort of take a few mm -hmm. classes. And then if you like it, find a place that maybe suits your needs yeah. a little bit better. Community centers are, are kind of the same thing. In my experience with community centers is you're going to get a wider variety of people like in your classes. Mm. You know, like my students at the community center are their new moms. I had a pregnant student over the summer, they're new moms. And then I had an 84 year old woman Getting doing it. chair yoga mm -hmm. with me. Yeah. yeah. She was fantastic. So yeah, you're going to have um, a wide variety of people in your classes, but also might have the same downsides to being in a gym in terms of it being kind of loud. You might not you might not have props. Mm. That's an upside to studios is that studios, generally speaking, will have a wide array of blankets, bolsters, blocks, straps, like everything that you could need. Whereas a gym and a community center will likely not have a ton of that stuff. So what should I be doing as someone who practices at home? I think having a dedicated corner, you really don't need a lot of space. I think all those people who say, oh, just do yoga, like with your kids around, blah, blah, no, blah. No, that doesn't work. No. At least not for me. No, no. This is like my time. So I always tell people to kind of splurge on the props that are going to make you happy. You don't need, they don't need to be expensive necessarily. But like, if you want a nice, comfy 
blanket, get yourself a nice comfy mm. blanket. Matt's in my experience have, have been kind of like you get what you pay for. The more expensive ones, they do tend to be better. They do tend to be more grippy. So just get something that you're going to, that you're going to feel good about rolling out. When it comes to physically doing a practice, there's tons and tons of videos out there, regardless of if you're going to practice at home or if you're going to practice in a studio or in a gym or anything, if you're just kind of going there for the first time, just watch the video first. Get an idea of what the postures are, what they're called. You know, some yoga instructors use all the Sanskrit, some just use just the English ver- the English words, some use both. I'm trying to use both. Mm. Shout out to Yoga with Adrian. She's a local gal from Austin, Texas. Oh yeah, I didn't know she was local. Yeah, and she does yoga on YouTube. She's got tons of good videos out there. She has a studio here in Austin. Yeah. One of the things I love about her is she has a calendar on her website that uh-huh. will like help you set up your own practice. Yeah. Uh, of what videos to watch when. She has like a 30 day or 31 day challenge at the beginning of the year to kind of get you going. And then she also, she has tons of free content on YouTube, but she also has a paid app. Um, there's tons of free stuff that you don't have to pay for to, to do this. You also have YouTube, right? I do. I have, I have free videos. That- yeah. Yes. Mine are not as fancy. I used to have a subscription to um, Yoga International. Mm. If you are going to do yoga regularly at home, I absolutely recommend getting a subscription to Yoga International. Mm. I think it's like $10 a month. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of videos on there of like all different kinds of yoga. Well, we want to link to your YouTube channel. So make sure you make sure you give that to us. Um, We'll post it in the show notes. Um, And we're also going to post some of the advice that Ariel is giving. Um, if you're a beginner and, and, and you had to choose maybe two or three props, which ones would you choose for someone? Oh, only two or three. Because I don't know how to use them. Right. I love props. Props are your friend. Pop, props are wonderful. Okay. So I would say get yourself a set of blocks. Okay. The thing that's nice about a block is because they are rectangular prisms, which is a math word. Um, they Ooh. have three dimensions <laughs> and each of their three dimensions is a different height. So you're really buying three different yes. blocks in one. Nerd Absolutely. alert. Yeah. Nerd. We need a like yeah, a nerd. That's why alert I love blocks. You. <laughs> I love you. You're right. You're correct. Um, it's three different heights and, and all that. You're totally right. Yes. Yeah, so the a good thing about blocks is that they do raise the floor up. So if, if your body proportions just make it really tough to kind of get down to the floor, you can use blocks. That's where I use blocks quite frequently because my legs are much longer than my arms. So I have a hard time with certain postures reaching the floor. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of lifts everything up. It also adds space in between. So if you are doing step throughs, oh. so if you are going from downward dog to say a forward fold, maybe you are larger bodied like myself or you're pregnant or you just have any other issues where, you know, stepping through might be a little bit harder. Having that extra space because your hands are on blocks mm. make it much, much easier. You could do an entire sun salutation on blocks. Oh, okay. And it's okay. fantastic. Yeah. So that's one of them. You get one more. Probably a strap. Okay. Not a blanket. You keep mentioning blankets. Isn't that for more of a, like a restorative? Yeah. So the blankets are really good. Blankets, I think, are good for people who need extra cushioning underneath their knees or their hands. Okay. So for um, for their wrists, like for myself, I always use a blanket underneath my knees because I have pointy kneecaps. Mm. And, and because I have pointy kneecaps, it hurts to like tabletop, anything that where I'm going to be on my, on my knees for more than like 10 seconds is painful. So, and I can't do anything about my no. kneecaps. Like there's no, no yoga that I could do that will do anything. So blankets are good. I think if you are one of those people who might need a little bit extra cushioning, I think blankets are good for that. Um, You can also use them underneath your wrists if you have um, wrist pain as well. Mm -hmm. That's my issue. So I would say, yeah. So I would say depending on the person, it could either be a strap or it could be blankets. Okay. I'm going to shift us a little bit here. What should I be looking for in a teacher? So in the United States, legally speaking, you do not need any training to teach yoga. 
Like oh. you could go into a gym and you could teach yoga, legally speaking. Would that happen? Probably not. The training that a yoga teacher will get is a 200 hour course. The 200 hour course, and it's it's best practices. So I'd be, I, you'd probably be hard pressed with the exception of Bikram, which is not Yoga Alliance certified. Yoga Alliance is a trade organization okay. for yoga teachers and yoga okay. schools. And Yoga Alliance, this trade organization, has a set of standards that yoga schools have to include in their programs in order to be Yoga Alliance schools. Okay. The yoga teacher themselves do not have to be registered with Yoga Alliance in order to teach. Okay. Most tend to be registered with Yoga Alliance. There might be studios. Studios tend to require you to be registered with Yoga Alliance. I am no longer registered with them, but I still have my 200 hour certification. I did 25 hours of yoga for all training. That is a training for people in larger bodies, Mm. disabled bodies, um, pregnant bodies, injured bodies, chronically ill bodies, basically anybody who is the normal human being then. Right. Yes. I also have 85 hours in prenatal. So I'm a prenatal, I'm also prenatal certified. It kind of goes up from there. So you'll see, you know, yoga teachers might have, you know, 500 hours, a thousand hours. Wow. Or, that's what you're, that's what you're going to generally see in the, in the United States. Yoga teachers with 200 hours are not physical therapists. Mm. They are not regular therapists, unless you're my therapist. <laughs> Who's who a certified therapist, a therapist and then happens to be a yoga teacher. <laughs> She's right. a licensed, right. right. Um, they are not doctors. Um, they are not registered dietitians. It's really important if you're going to work with a yoga instructor to kind of give them information about, you know, any injuries that you have, any pain that you're feeling if you're working with a physical therapist, Um, as much information as you're comfortable giving this person, please do not ask us to diagnose your weird back pain. And if somebody is diagnosing you, that's not a yoga teacher you need to be around unless they are a doctor, physical therapist, all of that sort of stuff. I do ask my students, like if I, the first day I meet them, but I, I, I talk to them one-on-one. Like when I meet my, my student at the door and I say, like, I have a whole thing, like, have you done yoga before? What are your goals for yoga? Is there anything about your body you want me to know? Mm, That's a good question. So that gives them the opportunity. Yeah. And then I follow, because they usually kind of look at me like, I'm like, you know, like injuries, surgeries, or anything you think that would be important for me to know so that I can be prepared when I make my sequence to ensure that I am keeping them comfortable, Mm. you know? And that you have some modifications in your hip pocket. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. Yes. And that's what I'll do. You know, I know I have people in my classes who have had plantar fasciitis. So when I tell them to do a particular stretch, I'll say, you know, ease up on this if you have plantar fasciitis. So I'm not calling out a particular student, right. you know, Jenny, don't do this. Yeah, definitely don't unload all of your, you know, all of your trauma and everything on your yoga teacher, but just kind of give them, you know, the basics that you're comfortable so that they can kind of keep you safe. The stuff that I personally look for when I'm going to do yoga, because I'm pretty bad about doing it at home. um, I personally look for places that are really knowledgeable about how to, how to use props. And you would think that lots of yoga teachers are, but a lot of them are not. I've been in classes where teachers did not cue how to use a prop until they saw me use it because I was the only one in the, in the class using it. So I like places that are very prop friendly because places that are prop friendly tend to also be places that are more accessible to people in different bodies. Um, That sounds about right. If a prop is supposed to help you access a pose and they don't have props, then that would make me think I'm not supposed to be here because I need this prop and they don't have it for me. Right. Okay. Right. And right. If that wasn't an issue in the yoga industry, I wouldn't have had to take an entire training on making sure that classes are accessible yeah, to all different sense. kinds of spots. Yeah. If I walk into a studio and the props are already laid out for me, that's a studio that I'm going to stay at. 
because it's like, okay, here, I'm going to give you these props. You don't have to use them, but you have them here if you want them. Yeah, that makes sense. Places that don't spout like diet culture and don't make yoga like completely about fitness because sure, I love a class that's going to challenge me and I love feeling really strong during yeah. class. The The physical portion of it is just one part of the eight limbs of yoga. And if you are only focusing on the physical aspect of it, like, what are you doing? Why am I here? Like, if I wanted to just stretch and work out, like I'd go to the gym, yeah. you know? Um, I look for diversity in the teachers and the student body. Explain what you mean by that. So I will go on a on a studio's website and I will take a look at their, their okay. teacher page. And I will look to see if they have teachers from a wide range of body types, mm. of people of color. Sure. I will look to see the workshops and the guest teachers that you're having. Yoga was founded in, in India. If you're not bringing in teachers of Indian descent, like this is their cultural, this is their heritage, like... Yeah, it does seem to be like it's possible that yoga could be taken over by like little white ladies and yep. profiting off of a of a cultural practice that does not belong to that culture. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate Absolutely. appreciate that, that it's, it's not just diversity in in body types, which is incredibly important, um, but also. Mm -hmm culturally i mean which is what people think of when they think of diversity they are primarily thinking of you know mm -hmm. cultural backgrounds and racial backgrounds but right. also body types is a big that's a big deal yeah i definitely want to see a commitment to acknowledging and honoring this practice that comes from a part of the world that has had a lot taken from them and appropriate it in a way that kind of strips it, you know, from what it was originally yeah. intended. I have been on that part of my yoga journey for the past like five or six years now. I think it's made me a better mm, teacher. Sure. I think it's made me a better human. Um, I think it's made me a better yoga student, but it has made me really picky when it comes to the studios that I'll go to, the places that I go to, um, because I want to make sure that they have the same core values. And that's kind of, that's something in general, like I'm talking about what I would seek for sure. in a studio, but like everybody's got to figure out like what their values are. And if the place that they're going to is upholding, you know, those values, yoga students want to see themselves in their teachers. That's all students. You know? That's everyone. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's yeah, a big absolutely. problem in education and in so, general is yep. a lot of students mm -hmm. who don't see themselves in their teacher. And that's a very difficult thing to overcome. And I, I mean, I would imagine, of course, that translates to the yoga community. Why not? Yeah, absolutely. And, and like, granted, I say this, like, you know, as a middle class mm -hmm. white woman, who is also bigger. Like I am in a bigger body. My classes tend to attract women in bigger bodies because they feel comfortable yeah. in my class. You know, they feel, because not only am I in a bigger body, but I, I go out of my way to teach in a way that is comfortable for their body, you know? Well, and you're um, talking about it too. Like you're, you're showing and right. demonstrating <laughs> that whatever your body size shape is it can still be a strong body it can still be a healthy right. body absolutely. so i think that that's incredibly mm -hmm. valuable absolutely one of the things that was was holding me back from doing yoga teacher training is because i didn't think people would take me seriously as mm. somebody who is in a larger body i thought people were going to be like oh i don't want a fat chick as my yoga teacher i got over it and i shelled out my money and did my yoga teacher yeah. training, but especially working at a gym, that was really, mm. really tough. And then coming into my own skin, I realized that it's a superpower in the, in a lot of ways. It ends up being a superpower. Yeah. Because my reputation was such that people who were new to yoga felt comfortable starting yoga yeah. with me. And that means a lot sure. to me. One thing, um, if you're shopping for a studio, I really liked when you said, you know, watch some videos and kind of familiarize yourself with the practice before you go. I would also recommend looking for studios that have a um, one week or one month trial rate rather than pay per class. Yes. Because you do want to get to know mm -hmm. the studio as a whole environment. 
you want to see the multiple teachers, you want to try different courses that they have. And so even if they don't have a week or a month um, trial rate, ask at the front desk uh, because you don't want to join a studio based on one $10 class. Yeah. When I started going to a studio here, they had like a 21 classes. Yeah, that sounds for like right, $30. Right, yeah. And it's a one-time good deal. You don't get to renew at that rate, right, but it lets right. you really taste right. what that studio is all about. Yeah. I like that. That's a good idea. Let's just bring this all together and kind of see if we can, you know, this is the teacher and me going, let's recap and make sure we all have an understanding of of what's happening. So are we doing an exit ticket, Miss Kendra? No, you know, I love those. Um, but no, we're not doing an exit ticket, but we are going to summarize our learning for today. If you're going, if you're going to do this long-term, or if you're really hoping that this, this becomes a part of your life, invest in good yoga mats and props that will be helpful for you. Treat yourself. Treat yourself. Yes. Yeah. Treat like treat yourself with that. Do it watch yoga videos to kind of get yourself familiar with vocabulary and and what to expect um, when you go into wherever you're going to do this. Maybe do some research a little bit ahead of time on some places nearby. Maybe look at social media, websites, et cetera, and kind of get a sense of what to expect. And I would say just like when we talked about Botox way back when, Talk to your friends. You never yeah, know. Ask a friend yeah. or maybe have someone come with yeah. you if you feel afraid. Like I would be like, I'm nervous. I can't do this. Yes, absolutely. I, I think every time I went to a new studio, I had a friend with me. And then once you feel comfortable enough, you can kind of let them back off if that's what they want to do. So that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, okay. I feel like that's given me a little bit of a sense of direction. Again, I'm a, I'm a good exerciser. I do that every day, but I want to incorporate more of this into my life just to bring the blood pressure back down again. <laughs> and also because I am hard yeah. on my body, I need something that's going to be a little bit more gentle with myself. So this is, this is good for me. Yeah. I think that's might be the hardest part is figuring out like yeah. what exactly you want from yoga. And that's usually why I ask people what their goals mm. are, you know, cause sometimes I can also like direct them to a different class. Oh yeah. That's a good idea. Happy to have you here. You know, I also don't want people to be feeling like the class is not what they want, you know? Right. You got to um, give them the, and you're welcome to be here. And this one in the future might be more helpful for you. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, what do I want from yoga? I worked with a private yoga teacher for a while and she would do that. She was like, today, we're going to talk about that hip that was bothering you last week. And she would mm -hmm. design an entire practice just for opening my hips. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Now, let me also tell you this. I'm not fancy. It was a private yoga class because no one else was in it. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> those are my favorite. We just knew that if I came for her nine o'clock class, no one was going to be there. The 10 o'clock was always full. Yes, At nine, yes. it was me and her. That's awesome. Especially with classes like that are new on the schedule. Sometimes it takes a while for people to get there. And I can't tell you how, especially at the gym, I can't tell you how many times I've only had like one student and they're like, oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm you're the only one here. I'm like, are you kidding me? If I was do if we were doing this like privately, I'd be charging a hundred dollars for this right now, and it's included in your nope. gym membership. Like, Score. eat it up, man. Right. What do you want to do? What do you right. want to work on? If this was when I was at a gym, that was nineteen dollars a month. Yes. Oh, that is yeah. Okay, so we've got get good equipment, watch some videos ahead of time, maybe research where you want to go, and understand what your goals are for your new yoga practice. So that's mm -hmm. our like four takeaways yeah. from this today. Okay. Yeah. I feel like that's a lot of good information. Yeah. And if you want to dive more into it, I sent you a whole bunch of my favorite teachers and stuff. And some, some of them are good for just like videos mm -hmm. and stuff. And some are better for really talking about the other eight limbs of yoga and what is being done to sort of, you know, honor the yeah. roots of yoga. So if you want to dive into that, yeah. Um, there are people who are doing that work, doing a much better job of that work than I could ever explain. Yeah. So there's a lot that people could dive That's into. That's awesome. Um, you sent that to me and I will make sure that it um, lives in our yeah. show notes so that people can access that. That's that's like an actual like deliverable yeah. that we will have for, for all of you guys who are listening. Okay. Anyway, so this is the part where we do the things. Mm-hmm. You know the deal. If you liked us, if you enjoyed the information that you got today, if you're staring at your phone and you're like, I was going to do something on my phone, but I don't remember what that was. Go in, 
and just give us a quick rating. Just tap the stars. That's all you have to do. Super easy, not hard at all. Just tap the stars. If you want to be tap, tap, tap a room, just a little, nice. little tippy tap. <laughs> so with that said, make good choices and watch Ariella do yoga and uh, use your gift cards. Bye. Hey friends, thanks for listening to the CK and GK podcast. Find us at CK and GK podcast on Instagram and Twitter and rate review and subscribe on Apple podcasts, Spotify, good pods, or anywhere else that you pod. See you next time.